Chapter 11 The next eight months, from summer of 1864 to the spring of 1865, were unlike anything Scarlet had ever known. They were full of hard, terrible work. Scarlet, Sue Ellen, and Carine had to plant cotton seeds. They had to work in the fields like slaves. They had to plant vegetables and cook and clean with Mammy and Dilsey. When Pork told her that the O'Hara's pigs had escaped just a few days before she had arrived at Tara, Scarlet made him hunt for the pigs in the woods. He was only able to find a few of the pigs, so that winter the family lived on very little meat. There were vegetables from the garden and corn in the field. The girls grew very thin, and their skin and hands became red and rough from working outside. Melanie had never really recovered from her little son Beau's birth. She was still pale and weak. In fact, before the baby's birth, the Hamilton family's doctor had told Melanie that she would only be able to have one child. However, although she couldn't work outside, Melanie was able to help Scarlett with duties inside the house. Sometimes, southern soldiers passed by the house. They were trying to return to their families in other parts of the South, because now the war was really over. The South was a conquered land, and the Northerners controlled it now. They were going to unify the South and North into the United States of America. Usually, the soldiers who came to Tara were almost dead from hunger and tiredness. Scarlet was always angry when these men asked for food and water because the family did not have enough to feed themselves. But Melanie always fed and comforted them the best she could. One day, when Scarlet grew angry at her for feeding yet another group of soldiers, she said sadly, Oh, Scarlet, please don't be angry at me. I know we don't have enough to feed ourselves, but I feed these men so that they can return to their wives and families, like I pray that Ashley will. Somewhere, maybe, Ashley is cold and hungry and trying to come home to me. I hope that some woman is feeding him. When she heard these words, Scarlet could say nothing. In the past months, the two women had not spoken of Ashley. Each was deeply afraid that he was dead because there had been no news or letters from him. One day, a soldier named Will Benteen came to Tara to ask for a little food. Although Scarlet did not normally talk to the soldiers who came to Tara, she liked Will's quiet, calm manner. He did not seem as upset about losing the war as the other soldiers Scarlet met. He seemed to accept that life was hard. Scarlet discovered that this was because Will was from the mountains and came from a very poor family. I didn't have money back then and I don't have money now. Nothing has changed. It's you rich people that are suffering the most said Will calmly. In the Old South, Will's family was the lowest class of people, poor farmers. But after the war, the South was not the same. Everyone was poor, even the best families. Scarlet decided to make Will an offer. Will, you can see that Tara is doing terribly. I've made everyone here work hard trying to plant a little cotton to sell sometime. But I'm working day and night just to try to feed us all, and we can't plant enough cotton. If we want to survive, we have got to sell cotton. I need money, Will, lots of money. If you stay here and help us plant and grow cotton and other crops, you can live at Tara. She waited anxiously while Will thought about her offer. Finally, he said... Miss Scarlet, I would be happy to help you make Tara successful again. 
The land here is good, and I think I can help you to grow plenty of cotton. It will be very hard, and it will take a long time, but I think we can do it. Then you'll stay here? Thank you, cried Scarlet. Will looked at her, a little surprised at her happiness. He did not understand the great relief she felt. During this time of trouble for the South, Scarlet had changed. Her temper was terrible, and she was often shouting at Pork, Mammy, Melanie, and her sisters. Sue Ellen and Carine complained about Scarlet to Melanie, and even Mammy thought Scarlet was being difficult. They did not understand that it was the family's terrible situation that made Scarlet so unpleasant to be with. Even though she didn't talk about her feelings, the truth was that Scarlet lived in a world of pain and fear. She was terrified of the family going hungry, and they never had enough to eat. And there was no money, because all Southern money was now almost useless. You couldn't buy anything with it any more. So Scarlet was deeply relieved when Will came. Here was another pair of hands to work the land. Poor Gerald was too weak and sick now to do anything. He sat on the porch and stared at nothing. Sometimes he would say to one of his daughters, Where's Ellen? Go and tell Ellen that supper is ready. Ellen's death had been a terrible shock to Gerald, and he could not accept that his wife was gone. Gerald could not help Scarlet now. Having a strong man at Tara helped greatly. Will was a very good farmer, and he was able to plant more cotton and grow vegetables. He was also a good hunter, so the family had a little more meat on their table. Will was a very quiet person who knew how to work hard. He was kind to Sue Ellen and Carine and listened to their stories about old friends in the happy days before the war. How long ago they seemed! Soon, Scarlet's sisters were very good friends with Will. One day, Scarlet and Melanie were sitting on the front porch of the house. Will was out hunting with pork. Scarlet was thinking to herself how long it had been since she had had a new dress or fixed her hair. She had not thought of any of these things in almost a year. The old Scarlet O'Hara was gone, and in her place a thin, angry woman stood. The only thing this woman thought about was staying alive. Melanie looked up and saw a man coming down the road. Scarlet, there's another soldier coming. I'll see what we have to eat in the kitchen. Suddenly, she stopped speaking and stood up. Scarlet was thinking how much she wished all the soldiers would just die where they were and leave Tara alone. She stared down the road at the man who was coming. He was tall and walked slowly. He had blonde hair. Wait! This wasn't just any soldier. It's Ashley! Chapter 12 Scarlet and Melanie could not believe it, but Ashley had somehow made it home. He had walked many miles to find Tara. Sadly, he came back to find his old home, Twelve Oaks, burned to the ground by the northern soldiers. The old South that he had known a few years ago was gone forever. Ashley had changed a lot in the past few years. He had always been quiet and serious, but now he seemed not to have any hope. He was extremely happy to see Melanie and his new son, Beau. Scarlet thought that his eyes looked strange and sad, but she didn't understand why. The truth was that in this new South, people had to work hard to survive. The kind of family a person was from did not matter any more. It was only important how hard you could work, growing food and helping your family survive. 
Ashley believed that he did not belong there any longer. All the things he had loved in the old South, like poetry, music, and books, were not important in the new South. He believed in his heart that he was a useless person. However, Scarlet was just happy to have Ashley near her again. She believed he still loved her, even though he was so sad all the time. Scarlet felt she would do anything to help Ashley become happy again, even if it meant helping Melanie also. To practical Scarlet, all Ashley needed was lots of money and a nice house to be happy. Many nights she thought about how she could help him. The family was growing. Now Scarlet, Wade, Will, Sue Ellen, Carine, Melanie, Ashley, and little Bo lived at Tara, as well as the servants Mammy, Pork, Dilsey, and Prissy. The large amount of people meant that more food had to be found. Therefore, they needed money. Money was still Scarlet's greatest worry in life, and she was always thinking about it. Often, she had nightmares about being cold, alone, and hungry in the darkness. She was beginning to think that, as long as you had money, you had no worries in life. Money was the most important thing in the world. Finally, after many long hours of thinking, Scarlet came up with a plan. With Will and Ashley working at Tara, Scarlet could rest a little. She decided to return to Atlanta for some time. There had to be some way she could make money for the family, lots and lots of money. Scarlet had many ideas, but she did not discuss them with Will or Ashley. If they knew what she was really thinking, they would never let her go. Scarlet needed a new dress to wear for her trip, but of course there was no money for the cloth. So she decided to use the lovely green curtains in the living room to make a new dress. Of course, Mammy disagreed with this idea. Miss Scarlet, don't go and ruin Miss Ellen's nice curtains. Mammy, be quiet. I need a new dress, and I'm going to have a dress. What do the curtains matter now? Said Scarlet, pulling the curtains down. Chapter Thirteen. When Scarlet arrived in Atlanta, the first thing she did was to go to the Hamiltons' home to see if it was all right. During the attack on Atlanta, Aunt Pity Pat and Uncle Peter had gone to Macon for a short time, but they had quickly returned to Atlanta when it was safe to do so. They welcomed Scarlet with many hugs and tears. Scarlet had some very strange ideas about how to make money. She had remembered that her dead husband, Charles Hamilton, had left her a little money in his will. He had made this will just before he left for the war, and he had given Scarlet everything he had. Scarlet had decided that if she had enough money, she would use it to buy a factory of some kind. She would find workers for her factory and pay them as little money as possible. Any money that the factory made would be sent to Will at Tara. Will would use the money to feed the family and buy pigs, chickens, crops, and cotton to plant. When the factory had lots of customers, Scarlet would offer Ashley a job working for her. Then. He and Melanie could move to Atlanta, and Will, Sue Ellen, and Carine could stay at Tara. Scarlet thought this plan was perfect. She knew that no one in Atlanta would understand or agree with her plan, but she did not care. In those days, women did not own businesses, and they certainly did not own factories. However. All Scarlet cared about were two things: Tara and Ashley. Even if the Northerners had taken everything else, Tara was hers. 
It was in her blood. Keeping the fields of Tara alive and well meant more to Scarlet than anything else, except Ashley. If Scarlet had a factory, she could send money to Will at Tara, and he could buy more cotton to plant. Ashley would have money and something to do in Atlanta, and he would be near her. The thought of Ashley still made shivers run up and down Scarlet's back. She did not think for a moment that Ashley might want to do something else with his life. Scarlet decided that a lumber factory was the best kind to buy because the people of Atlanta needed lumber to repair their damaged houses. She had found a small, dirty-looking lumber factory for sale a few miles away from the Hamilton house. She spoke with the bank that had kept her money from Charles's will. Luckily, Charles had been smart enough to leave her the money in gold pieces. Gold was always valuable, but paper money was not. Unfortunately, Scarlet discovered that she did not have as much gold as she would need to buy this lumber factory. She would have to find a way to get more money from someone. But how? A week after Scarlet arrived in Atlanta, Aunt Pitypat heard some exciting gossip. Scarlet, you'll never guess who's here again, she said at dinner that evening. Who, Aunt Pitypat? asked Scarlet. Rhett Butler. I wonder what that awful man has been doing. I heard that after the war, he went to Europe for a while. He is the only person I know who did not suffer in the war. Oh, that terrible man! I do hope he will not visit us here. Oh, dear, what would people say? All my friends would be so angry with me. And Aunt Pitypat left the dinner table worrying. When Scarlet heard Rhett's name, all her anger at him returned. She had not forgotten the night of her escape from Atlanta and how Rhett had abandoned her in the road. Her green eyes flashed with fire. That dirty, rotten, horrible rat! I hope he doesn't dare to even speak to me. I shall hate him forever for what he did, she thought. She almost hoped she would see Rhett so that she could have the pleasure of being angry and unkind to him. Suddenly, Scarlet had a thought that almost made her choke on her food. Rhett had money. He was the richest person she knew. If Scarlet could persuade Rhett to lend her the money to buy the factory, everything would be all right. But how could she do that? Scarlet decided that if Rhett wasn't in love with her, she would have to make him fall in love with her. Then he'll probably do anything I want, she thought. Scarlet was certain her plan would work, because she had always been able to have any boy she wanted. Rhett won't be any different, because men are all alike, she said to herself. She smiled happily. This was going to be fun. Now, all Scarlet had to do was to find Rhett without letting Aunt Pitypat know what she was doing. She asked Aunt Pitypat's friends a few questions and found out that Rhett was living in a hotel nearby. She was a little surprised that he had not been to visit her, but probably he didn't know she was in town. The next morning, Scarlet dressed in the green dress that she had made from the curtains at Tara. The green material was beautiful and matched her eyes perfectly. As she looked in the mirror, Scarlet was glad that she was prettier than ever and her figure was still slim. She was even a little thinner than before. The important thing was not to let Rhett see her hands. They were very rough and red from all the hard work at Tara, and the fingernails were broken. They were no longer the soft, white hands of a lady. Rhett could never know how hard she had been working. It just wouldn't be right. Scarlet arrived at the hotel where Rhett lived and was shown to his room. 
Her heart was pounding as she knocked on the door. She was strangely excited to see Rhett, even though she was still angry with him. At least he was never boring. Scarlet! cried Rhett as he opened the door. What a surprise to see you! Immediately, Scarlet began her plan. Oh, Rhett! Thank God you're all right! she cried. She threw her arms around him and pretended that she was about to cry. Where have you been? I was so afraid you would be hurt in the fighting, or even worse. Why haven't you been to see me? she said. Scarlet, I never thought you would be so worried about me, said Rhett. He looked very happy to see her, thought Scarlet. There was something about the look in his eyes that made Scarlet think, He's in love with me already. They sat down at the table. Well, Rhett, tell me everything. Where have you been? said Scarlet, smiling sweetly and looking as if she was extremely interested. Rhett told her all about his adventures. After the war, he had gone to New Orleans for a time and then to Europe. Although she was thinking about how to ask Rhett for money, Scarlet could not help but be interested in his stories. Rhett was more interesting to talk to than almost anyone she knew. He could even make her laugh. Finally, Rhett stopped talking and, looking at her closely, asked, Now, Scarlet, how are you? And what have you been doing? How is everyone at Tara? Oh, Everything is just wonderful at Tara, Rhett. Everyone is happy and healthy, and we don't have any problems, Scarlet said slowly, hoping Rhett would believe her. Oh, Rhett, that's why I came to see you. I just couldn't stand it, knowing that while I was at Tara, so happy and without a care in the world, you might be alone, sick, or hurt. I had to see if you were all right. Rhett looked amazed. Why, Scarlet, can it be that you. you care about me? It seems that you have grown a heart, a real woman's heart. Scarlet stared up into his eyes. I have, Rhett, I know I have. Before Scarlet had time to think, Rhett took one of her hands and put it to his face. What was he going to say? Suddenly he looked at the hand and then at her. Your hands! They're rough and red. These aren't the hands of a lady. You've been working like a slave. You lied to me. Why? Oh, no, Brett. I went for a ride on my horse last week and fell off. Scarlet, stop inventing stories. Rhett said in a hard voice. I only half believed you when you said everything is just wonderful at Tara anyway. Do you think I am a fool? Now, why are you really here? I know you better than you think. You must want something from me. What is it? Money? Scarlet gave up her act. All right, Rhett, I admit it. I need money to. to buy a factory. I want to run a factory and send the money to Tara. To keep it running so that all the people there can eat. I know everyone in Atlanta will think it's awful, but I don't give a damn. You don't know how horrible it's been, Rhett. The past year has been like a horrible dream. All the work and fear, the terrible fear of always going hungry. So finally, I decided to come here and do whatever I had to do to get some money from you. You're the only man I know who can help me, and please, Rhett, you've just got to give me the money. Rhett looked amazed. In his own mind, he admired Scarlet's determination deeply. She was willing to do whatever it took to keep Tara and her family alive and well. Who is living at Tara now, Scarlet? Too many people, Rhett. Will Benteen, who's been like a brother to me. He's helping me build Tara up again after all the Northerners destroyed it. Then there's Melanie and the baby, Bo, and Prissy and Wade 
and Mammy and Pork and Dilsey and Sue Ellen and Karine and Ashley. At the mention of Ashley, Scarlet saw a strange, angry look in Rhett's eyes. So, the honorable, elegant Ashley Wilkes has come back from the war alive, eh? What is he doing at Tara? Probably sitting around trying to chop wood like a slave and dreaming of you. I wonder what Mrs. Wilkes thinks. She's so good and wonderful that she can't imagine what the two of you are really thinking. Both of you make me sick. I am sure that your little plan to make money is intended to help him more than anyone else. Isn't it, Scarlet? Answer me. Scarlet was furious. How did Rhett know her so well? Still, her plan was not just to help Ashley. Rhett Butler, you no good, dirty rat, how dare you say things like that to me? She shouted. You haven't got the smallest idea how terrible it's been at Tara. And there are so many people to feed. Who cares if Ashley's one of them? Yes, if it makes you feel better, I do want to help Ashley. You couldn't possibly understand. You, you've never loved anyone. Oh, I could hit you. Rhett burst out laughing. Save your hits, Scarlet. All right. I am sorry I made you so angry. I can see that saving Tara is truly important to you. And I truly admire your determination to own a factory in spite of what people will say. You are good at telling others what to do, I am sure. Thank you, Scarlet said coldly. However, none of my money is available at this time. It's all in gold and it's in Europe. I couldn't give you any money, even if I wanted to, which I don't, Rhett said cheerfully. So, Scarlet, you'll just have to think of some other way to make money. I would gladly give money to help Tara, but I am sad to say that I will not give money to help Ashley Wilkes in any way. But I know you. You're smart. If any girl can find that money, you can. Rhett Butler... You let me talk on and on like that. You were never going to give me any money. I hope you die like the dog you are. Oh, I shall hate you until I die for this. Goodbye, shouted Scarlet. And then Scarlet did try to hit Rhett, but he moved aside just in time, laughing. Oh, Scarlet, don't hate me for that long, please. That would be terrible. Goodbye, my lady. Soon we shall meet again. Scarlet walked out of the hotel room, slamming the door behind her.